What is up, players? It's War Boss Tay up in this mug. Welcome to part two of my how to paint a Menoth Cinerator. I think I like a like a dum dum. I was saying Menoth in my first video. You gotta get that out of my head. I've always thought it was pronounced Menoth, but Menoth, Protectorate of Menoth. So this is what it's gonna look like at the end of today's video. The colors we're using are Menoth White Highlight from the P3 range, Abaddon Black, Sanguine Highlight. Screamer Pink, Emperor's Children, Dark Reaper, and Rust Gray. If you do not have P3 colors or access to P3 colors, you can use for Menoth White Highlight, you can use Pallid Witch Flesh, and for Sanguine Highlight, you can use Screamer Pink. So here's what our model is going to look like after the end of the first video. We're going to go straight to Menoth White Highlight. Now, normally, well, I, actually, I don't want to say normally, but an alternate way of doing this would be to build up with Menoth Base because that was the original color before we dry brushed the Menoth White and then we put the shade on. But I think this is going to get us to where we want to go a little bit faster. And it kind of cuts out that unnecessary step because we have that darker Menoth Base color in the shades or in the, in the cracks and the crevices because of the shades, because of the Seraphim Sepia. Uh, again, if you are just seeing this video after I had already taken out the music, you'll notice there's no music. And that is because I put the music on a separate track. I'll include the link below. So while you're playing this video, just pop that track on in another window or play it off your phone or whatever. Um, and then you can have the original tutorial soundtrack using the uh, all of the tracks that I, I normally use. And if you're not going to be interested in that, you can play any sort of background music you want. Or just listen just listen to my voice and the chirping birds in the background. So, okay, I am using a, a pretty small brush for this. When I was filming this video, I didn't have access to the new brushes that I'm using. And uh, these new brushes are fantastic, you guys. They are from a company called Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary Company brushes. Let me see if I can grab them real quick. All right, Rosemary and Company quality artists brushes, and um, I'm I'm using those right now. I'm testing those out. I'm going to be doing a a full fledged review on them. And uh, let me just tell you, as a person who's been painting for years and years and years, I I really really like these brushes. They are just really really good. And um, I'll, I'll tell you all about them, what they're made of, and where you can get them, and, and how much they cost. But actually, if you want to go and check them out right now, Rosemary & Company has their own website where you can check out their brushes. They have so many different kinds of brushes. It's just really, really amazing. Uh, back to the model, though. I'm using this Army Painter brush right now, back to what I was originally saying. And it's, it's pretty good. I think it's the Insane Detail brush so there, there's not that many bristles it's easy to put uh, control the amount of paint you have on your brush so what not what I'm doing is I have the color on the side of me in my wet palette and I'm thinning it down with a little bit of water and when I put it onto my brush you can see that I don't have a glob of paint on the tip of my brush I'm just using a little bit my generally my my um, my philosophy is use less than you need because you can always add more paint it's a lot harder to uh, correct the mistake where you have too much paint on your brush and you put it on your model. If you <clears throat> if you notice, for those of you who try to find deals on eBay and stuff, a lot of secondhand armies that are for sale, Space Marine armies especially, but you know, any, any kind of army that a beginner painter just kind of gives up on, usually the reason why is because uh, the, the reason why the models don't turn out looking the way they want it to is because there's just too much paint. If you put too much paint on your brush and you paint too much paint onto your model, it's going to look thick, it's going to look loopy, it's not going to look good. And uh, most of, the, most of the, the miniatures you see painted are done in multiple layers. If I, was, uh, if, if I had the inclination to, if I really, really wanted to go for, you know, Golden Demon level kind of quality, uh, which, which I'm, I'm trying to maintain a, a good balance between quality and kind of uh, efficiency, 
of my time, I would do five or six, maybe even seven layers of really thin down paint, starting towards the center and then thinning the paint down as it gets closer to the edges because that's where the wash is. That's where the wash dried. If you see where the white plate meets the red edging, um, there is a little bit of seraphim sepia on all of those edges. And uh, if you put the brightest amount of paint in the center and then feather it out, thin it down as you're working your way towards the edges where all that wash and shade is located, then you'll create some really nice blends. And then you could even add colors. Uh, you can even mix your colors and um, create all sorts of, of interesting transitions and effects. But the effect that I want to go for is actually a very clean and uh, bright ivory bone color. And uh, when, when, when you have that as a base, then adding in that seraphim sepia will create a very cool looking aged and uh, weathered eff effect <clears throat> without doing something as crude as adding rust, uh, rust and um, oil. I don't want to add anything to make the models look dirty, but I do want to make these protectorate of Menoth models look uh, very, like, very much like a relic, like relics, like they're, they're using this gear and um, all of the items are almost like artifacts and so uh, there, there's there's a great deal of reverence and um, they're not just cool to look at and uh, there's there's history there's like the weight of history behind each of them if that makes sense I mean when you when you look at stuff a, a lot of cool paint jobs you see on cool cool mini or not and online and in the white dwarf visions make the <clears throat> Um, models look like they are like they've been weathered because these are in the fiction of the games th these are weapons of war you know they're not meant as a showpiece fresh off the assembly belt um, models they they are supposed to look like they have been worn and used and uh, that that they've been uh, chipped and battered so so uh, creating that effect of like the, the, the history and the weight of time behind these models. The way I'm interpreting that for this, this specific uh, color scheme is that I'm putting that seraphim sepia. I'm not using an Agrax Earthshade or a Nuln Oil because that would be very dark. It might um, uh, create good shadows, but it won't give the impression that a nice brown uh, sepia wash will, will, will give. So, when thinking about painting your models and the color scheme you want to go with, I think that is a, a great thing to keep in mind. How, how dark do you want your models to go? And um, when, when you're done shading and highlighting, what is the effect you want your models to have? Do you want it to look like they've been uh, fighting for a long time? Maybe, they're, maybe this is their first campaign and, and they are fresh off the assembly, assembly line. And that would change not only the colors you use to paint the model, but also the shades. If I wanted to make my model look like it was really battered and, and weather beaten and, and uh, time worn and that it was not taken care of in between engagements, then I would use Agrax Earthshade because that would create the effect of oil that had been dried up uh, coming out of the cracks and um, uh, kind of stuck in the in the creases between the armor plates and just deposits of dirt and oil and, and everything but doing a sepia wash creates um more of more of like a, a naturally aged look to the to the bone to the ivory uh again the the camera that i'm using the i'm, I'm constantly trying to fix it if anybody has any any suggestions on how to keep my my uh, models from from blurring as much as it does I'm always looking to to improve it. I'm again. I'm not using my um, my computer monitor to 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 look at what I'm doing. I'm actually just kind of ho hoping that it's it's in focus and in frame. And then every once in a while, I'll peek over my shoulder and look through the viewfinder to make sure it's it's still in focus. But uh, unfortunately, a, a side product of that is that it's uh, the models are always going to look a little bit. Uh, they're always going to get a little bit out of focus if the camera decides to focus on my thumb or uh, on, on a different part of the model. I think maybe it might have something to do with the uh, cardboard background too. Maybe I should get a different color, um, I guess, mat to put on my table. But when you're using Menoth White Highlight, 
what I've noticed is that it's very similar to Games Workshop's old Skull White. And uh, their Ceramite White is a little bit better. In fact, for some reason, every Ceramite White pot that I've opened when I was in Hawaii, back when the, the paint range first came out, and uh, every time I've wanted to try and get a new pot, invariably after the first week or so, the paint would dry up and it would clump and it would separate and uh, it was really, really bad. But I bought one paint pot of Ceramite White when I was up here and it uh, it came out pretty well. So, I don't know, maybe it has something to do with the, just the, the location of where I am. I don't know, who knows? Science, you know? But if, um, if you'll notice, the, the old Skull White was very clumpy. It was very thick and even if you tried to thin it out, unless you used a wet palette, if you try to, um, you know, wipe some of your paint off on your on your on your hand or on your napkin, it would always dry up really quickly. So uh, you had to add a little bit of water, and you had to use a wet palette. Like I said, Menoth White Highlight is very similar in consistency to that old Skull White. It's very uh, thick. It goes on your paintbrush very thick, and the, um, it's not. It's not easy to use if you're not using a wet palette. So if you can, always use a wet palette. And if you don't have access to the P3 paints, like I said, Palette Witch Flesh is the closest equivalent. It's a little bit lighter than Palette Witch Flesh, though. Palette Witch Flesh still has a, a little bit of, of a, a darker beige tan color to it. So maybe adding just a little bit of White Scar or Ceramite White to your Palette Witch Flesh will bring it up to the Menoth White Highlight. As I mentioned in the last video, you want to take care that your model um, is getting paint in all the correct places. So he's got some armor. His arm is holding that giant honking shield up, but you got to highlight up the uh, the arm underneath behind the shield, even if it's pressed up close against his body. Because invariably, at some point, you're going to pick up your model or somebody's going to pick up your model and they're going to hold it at a funny angle and see that you missed a spot. So you, you do not want that to happen. Now when you're painting these shoulder pads, this goes for any kind of large armor piece or even a shoulder pad like a Space Marine or, or an armor plate. You want to start with your paint kind of thinned down like I mentioned on your wet palette and start at the center of the plate and then using a lot of short uh, paint strokes to, to thin and spread the paint out on the surface. You want to pull the color towards the edge of the plate where it meets the next a separate material. So th that red edging of his shoulder pad, we're working our way towards that, but we don't want to touch right up against it. Because if you do that, then you're going to um, muddy the Seraphim Sepia shade that is kind of connecting and creating those, those shadows. If you do that though, that's fine because we will go back and uh, clean that up with some Seraphim Sepia later in the more final stages. But um, yeah, in general, when you're painting these highlights on, you want to start at the center of where that highlight color is and and then uh, pull your colors to the side. Again, you can see that I'm doing a lot of short brush strokes. I'm not just doing long single strokes and uh, that is to really spread the paint out as, as it's going onto this, the material because you don't want it to, you don't want it to uh, dry on your on your model. All right, pulling back a little bit, we're going to get to work on the front plate. And you'll notice that on the front section that we're highlighting right now, there are some runes etched into the armor. And that means that you can read them because the Seraphim Sepia wash should have gone into those uh, carved in runes and created the uh, the illusion of the lettering, making it darker and easier to read when you're looking at the model. So the way we're going to keep it like that is we're not going to paint straight on uh, coming from the front. When you're painting the highlight on, you want to come at an upper angle, like going from kind of where the head is and then dragging the paintbrush slowly down. And you don't want to use your whole brush. You want to use maybe just the tip of the brush because that way the paint stays controlled and it doesn't seep into those grooves. And again, using short strokes short uh, and 
a succession, a series of shorter strokes will allow you to kind of control the paint as it goes onto the model. Same thing working with these uh, shoulder pads. Again, there um, there's a symbol in the center of them, that black Menoth symbol. And the Seraphim Sepia should have dried where the black meets the ivory of the shoulder pad, creating a nice depth and some nice shadows. So when we're painting in our highlight onto the main part of the shoulder pad armor, we want to start away from those shadows, away from the black design, and then move the paint in towards the black design, stopping right where the shadows are to create the illusion of depth. Now you can see that I'm working on the shield, and the same principle goes for this. It's just a little bit bigger because the symbol on the shield is this black sculpted on Menoth symbol that the Seraphim Sepia should have dried along the sides of, connecting it to the ivory color of the backing. So we're just putting on that Menoth white highlight onto the backing, kind of in the center of uh, splitting the difference where the where the black design meets the gold edge and then just using short strokes to pull the color towards the edge. It's a it's a trick that I learned uh, a long time ago from this really good really talented painter back in Hawaii Kenneth and he taught me that um, if you create the uh, lines Instead of doing like a very smooth transition, it's a great way to uh, distract the eye. And if, if a viewer is looking at a model and he sees a bunch of, a, a series of, of, of lines uh, that, the, that the highlight color is painted on in, then it'll, um, it'll, create, it'll create that transition and uh, that cool look. So I do it a lot with my organic or my cloth materials. You see I have a lot of short, obvious uh, strokes on the like orc pants, orc trousers, or on orc skin, or even uh, human skin highlights. But uh, doing it on armor is also possible, and it'll create the illusion of, of um, highlighted surfaces, the, the light hitting the surface. Okay, so we are back after uh, letting the paint dry for a little while. And uh, we're going to go Ceramite White now. Now, Ceramite White is a little bit different because it is the, I guess, it's a pure white. There's no, there's no uh, beige kind of undertone to it. There's no cream, ivory, off-white color. Ceramite White is as, as white as you can go. So when we're shading it or when we're looking at it, we want to uh, create the shadows using blues, dark blues, grays, and um, not, not getting all the way down to black. But you can see that the... The robe that we had painted Celestra Gray in the first video, we are going to pretty much just paint over all of that and uh, maybe leave a little bit of the Celestra Gray in the folds, but we're really going to add our shading in, in the next couple of steps. You see that the Ceramite White that I'm painting on is really thin and you can see right through it almost. I have to, you just might have noticed that I'm shaking my paint pot really, really hard because uh, I'm trying to use the paint and it's just not cooperating with me at this time. So we're putting it on, but it's it's a little watery, it's a little oily, and uh, I'm gonna just let it dry and I'm gonna keep adding multiple layers. Now, this is exactly the reason why I didn't start with Ceramite White. If you're asking, well, wh why not just skip the step of the Celestial Gray? Why not just start with Ceramite White? And the answer to that is because when you're painting on such a bright, stark color as white, like this pure ceramite white, when you're putting that on top of an undercoat, even a white undercoat, oh, excuse me, it's so bright, it's at the, it's at one complete end, it's at the complete end of the spectrum. So generally, even though you, you could do that, I always like to start with a color that's a little bit darker and then work my way up to that final highlight of white. So in the front, again, I'm using my smaller brush, my detail brush for this. I'm basically just trying to catch the folds of his robe or that are on his tabard. And yeah, so so and, and so I'm I'm looking for those folds that are pushing the cloth forward. It looks like the, the model is in motion or there's a wind 
blowing his uh, clothes from behind. So basically I'm just trying to paint the areas that are pushed forward up into the light. Going back to the Menoth base highlight. Oh, I almost did it again. Menoth. So sometimes you want to do this. Let, let your highlight paints dry a little bit and uh, then go back, hit it again, hit it a second layer, hit it with a second layer after you let the first layer dry. And it's basically just a way to clean up your work, hide your paint strokes, the brush strokes from the, the step before, and create a smoother transition. And it's, it's a step that I highly recommend. When you're highlighting your models, think about doing it twice. Going in for a second highlight, same color. And again, you want to really thin down that, that Mena white highlight. The last thing you need is on one of your larger surface areas, your larger plates, uh, the last thing you need is for your model to uh, start showing those paint streaks. Okay, the center section here. It's a little bit tricky to get in there. That's why it's good to have a, a small brush that is meant to do fine detail. Because again, we're really trying to keep the shade of that seraphim sepia on the on the edges. If you make a mistake in the center, because those those armor plates are very small, that shield is blocking a, a lot of the angle to, to get at them. You can always go back with seraphim sepia on a small thin brush and paint in the lines, uh, line it in. You know, it's funny because a lot of people compliment me for my work, and uh, they they say that the the paint brush the paint jobs are very clean and stuff. And all that is is just a matter of practicing and using more than one layer so that you can smooth your smooth your colors out, keep nice even transitions, and uh, and you don't have to worry. Okay, sometimes I might just go and clean up a mistake that I made. You can see that I got some of that off white highlight on the black symbols there on the shoulder pads. So I'm just going back over with some Abaddon black and touching that up. And after washing my brush, I'm going right back to my Menoth white highlight. And again, thin down paints, multiple layers, that's, that's the way to do it. Now in this uh, center section of the armor on the back, the seraphim sepia, you want that to be on the sides where that center section is kind of raising, raising up. And um, when, you're, when you're painting these highlights on, you want to be especially careful to not put too much paint there because if you're going to see any brush strokes right where the seraphim sepia meets that large armor, uh, larger armor piece, it's really going to uh, take away from the quality of your paint job. So use less than you need. Always use less paint than you think you need. And always use like a wet palette or some other way to thin down your paint. Now the fun part. Sanguine highlight is the first color we're going to be painting onto all of the red areas. Sanguine highlight is a, a, a reddish purple kind of color. It's it's a little bit brighter than Screamer Pink, I believe. And uh, we're going to be painting this onto the Sanguine base color. Now what we're doing is we're trying to look for the areas that are closest towards the top, the areas that are closest towards the light source, and we're going to try to, try to fo focus and concentrate on those if we can, and uh, leave some depth 
in the in the darker areas so that it creates a little bit of a cool contrast. Yeah, so I've got a little bit of that paint on the tip of my brush and I'm really just trying to focus on one edge of, of each section that will really uh, help to keep it uh, consistent. If I painted too much on, on all of the sides and edges, then the, um, the lower color, the previous color might get covered up. Some of these hardest parts to paint are just the uh, rims A lot of them, like the ones on these back armor plates, are so small that if you make a mistake, there's no shame in going back over with the Menoth white highlight or even the Menoth base and kind of cleaning up that red color because red is going to, this sanguine color is going to contrast so well with the rest of um, the, the red, that sanguine base. So if we want it to look nice, we got to just make sure we we keep that depth of the previous color in there. We don't want to cover it completely and make it look this, like this bright reddish pink, but at the same time, we, we do want to draw the eye to it. Yeah, we're hitting those shoulder pieces right now. And uh, don't forget to, to be painting underneath those, underneath the armpits. And now we're trying to get the cloth on his, his hand, wrapped around his hand. And for this, you can really have fun with those lines because it's a smaller, uh, the, the, the texture, the feel of the material is supposed to be different. It's supposed to be cloth rather than this hard metallic or hard metal plates. So the way I do that to differentiate is I kind of create thinner lines of paint when I'm painting on these highlights, uh, like here with, with the tassels. You want to put your brush strokes on and have them be at different lengths, especially with the tassels where you're pulling the lines down towards the bottom so you can see that, uh, that effect that, you know, the texture that tassels have. It's all uneven and it's all just kind of hanging there. So uh, create, if you can, that illusion of different lengths of brush strokes to, uh, to do that. We're hitting all of those red plates that have those gold studs on them. Yeah, again, we're kind of sticking towards the uh, where all of the armor points kind of converge into a point. And you can tell on the armor where that is on the shoulder pads. They uh, kind of create that folded plate look on, of the shoulder pads, but it creates those definite points at the top and the bottom there. So even if you don't put too much of that highlight color on your model, you want to keep a little bit of, of it reserved for where it pulls to the point, just so it looks like the light is catching it at that angle.
Yeah, now we're working on the uh, neck guard there, the piece right above the chest plate. These guys are so beefy. They have so, they're so armored. Look like just large walking tanks, suits of armor. Okay, so you've got those silver screws set in the neck you might remember from our first video. And we want to make sure we don't get any of that pink paint into that. So uh, just be careful when you're getting that in. And then when you're coming up through the back behind the head, you want to line line the edges of both sides of that strip. And uh, just try try to, of course, keep it on the red area. Okay, now we're, um, you can really create a pretty cool effect over here because the chest piece is very dark red. So when we're putting on that highlight color, it's going to look pretty, pretty cool. Keep it to the, um, the bottom half of that red strip and uh, you can create a very cool looking highlight. Yeah, very uh, tedious work, this highlight step. Um, it doesn't have to be, but I'm, I'm choosing to go the extra distance and create that uh, that smooth transition of color. And so, you know, every, every paint job you ever do is gonna be a labor of love and a, a, a commitment of your time. And boy, if I was batch painting these, it'd be even, uh, I think it would be even easier though, actually, now I think about it, when, when you're, building one model from start to finish it's uh, it gets a little bit daunting when you finally finish it after all the work you put in and you move to the next model and it's at like stage one i think having all these models coming up together at the same pace is is the way to go because there's so much detail um it's, it's going to drive you nuts bonkers if you have to go back to the next model i think get, get them all done get them all out of the way and then move on to the next step for all of them. Then get that all done out of the way, move on to the next step. Okay, the highlight for the highlight for our model here, the, the reds, is we're gonna take Emperor's Children, we're gonna be mixing it into, you can either mix it into the Sanguine Highlight, or you can mix it into Screamer Pink. I believe I'm mixing it into Screamer Pink. It's going to create a little bit of a, a pinker purplish color that is going to contrast really well with the dark red in the shadows. And again, having a wet palette is perfect for this because you don't have to worry about your, your paints mixing in the wrong pot, in the other pot and uh, it will stay usable for hours after you leave the table as long as there's a little bit of, of water at the bottom there uh, at the bottom of the clamshell underneath the paper towel i've had wet palettes last me overnight i'd, be, I'd paint till 10 11 o'clock at night decide i'm tired go to sleep and wake up in the morning and come back to the table and the paint is still usable so when you're mixing paints i cannot recommend wet palettes highly enough you can go all fancy and do uh, parchment paper. That's uh, the preferred way to do it. A uh, clamshell with water and then a parchment paper strip on top. Or you could just do a paper towel. I call that the, the ghetto wet palette because um, anybody has napkins or Kleenex or paper towels. Paper towels are the best because Kleenex sometimes have lotion on it that will 
uh, that, that will kind of mess with the paint if you're not careful. But a nice dry paper towel, just put it over some water in a clamshell pack and uh, you've got a perfect ghetto wet palette that will do the exact same thing as the parchment paper. It might dry out a little bit faster though and the paints might not um, be as easy to work with. Yeah, so this color is going to look really, really nice. We're um, really trying to show a difference in the highlight from the, the darker colors and adding a little bit of Emperor's Children is just the thing. You don't want it to be too bright. If, you're, if, we, if we were using Emperor's Children straight out of, out of the pot, even if we, we thin it down on our wet palette, it's a little bit too pink, which is why we're adding it to the Screamer Pink. That darker purple will, will even it out, make it look really good. And uh, you don't have to use a wet palette with parchment paper. That's the preferred way of using it. Um, but you can use a paper towel. So these figures are great. I think, I, I'm, I think the client said some of these figures were from the starter kit for War Machine. The Protectorate of Menoth versus Kador. Kador. No idea how to say that one either. Um, but... They look great, and having having starter kit where you've got two different factions, and uh, the models look so completely different, allow you to really uh, have fun with the paint schemes. I know when Island of Blood came out for Warhammer Fantasy, and you had that high elf noble on the Griffin, and then you had um, you know you had the Skaven clan rats, and you had rat ogres, and um, the Illyrian reavers on the horses. This just a variety of models and model types you could paint, the infantry, the cavalry, the bigger monsters. That's what's fun about those uh, larger starter sets. The Dark Vengeance kit having the um, cultists for the first time and uh, being able to paint those and the, the Chaos Space Marine Chosen and all, all the characters. Like the Dark Angels characters, or the, the Space Marines were okay, but I mean, being able to use, or being able to paint all those different types of models. I think that was really, really cool. All right, so we're, we're slowly pushing our way towards the finish of this video. And um, stay tuned for the third video, the part three, where we are going to wrap this up. And we're going to be, um, I guess, bringing in some of the depth and the shadows back using Seraphim Sepia, kind of uh, bringing that uh, depth back into the, the, the model. And we're also going to be painting the gold up to what it's eventually going to be, the yellow gold using Vallejo's Liquid Gold series. So find some rich gold if you don't have any in your collection because that is really going to bump up the finished look of your model. And uh, also we're going to be doing the folds of the white robes in the in the third video using some shades that we're going to make out of um, some regular layer paints and some Lamian medium. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be really fun. Usually when uh, when a beginner is painting white like on cloth, it's uh, very, very, very tricky to find the way to shade it and highlight it so it looks like natural. A lot of times I've seen people shade with known oil. Yeah, a, a, I don't want to say a rookie mistake, but a very beginner technique is to paint in uh, paint paint robes or paint cloth all in white and then shade it with known oil and just kind of leave it because it looks a little bit more realistic and dark and grim and stuff but uh, when you're doing models and uh, miniatures and and painting like this you do want to have that depth and that that grim darkness but you also want to have a little bit of transition and a little bit of of, uh, of depth between the dark and the light so i'll show you how you do that in, in the next part in the next video 
But uh, wrapping up here, we're heading into the, the home stretch. And oh, do I do it here? I think I do it here. Okay, yeah, let's do it here. Why not? Let's do it live. Let's do it right now. So you're going to take your Dark Reaper first. Oh, no, we're not doing the robes first. <laughs> uh, so dumb. Um, we're doing the, the black symbols. I think the robes are such a such an endeavor to shade and highlight those up that I couldn't remember if I did it at the end of this one or at the beginning of part three. I think it's part three. Yeah, I think I already I was looking at the the watch at my watch and I was like, oh, I'm this video is running a little bit long. Forty two minutes is a little bit long for a tutorial. So basically, with this, we're finding all of the black symbols on our model. That's on the the neck guard there, the shield and the two shoulder pads. And basically we're just painting Dark Reaper onto the surfaces, onto the, uh, the um, I guess the center of the design. You don't want it too much on the sides. You want your Abaddon Black to kind of stay on the, the, the flat sides, but on the line of the center of the design, you want to have a little bit of that, uh, that design on it. The Dark Reaper, rather. And after this, we're going to highlight with rust gray, which is going to go onto the center. And if you can make it even uh, thinner than the Dark Reaper strip of paint, and that will create a cool transition from the, the, the black to the Dark Reaper to the rust gray. The rust gray is going to be the lightest. That's going to be kind of what the what we're going to say the light is reflecting off of. All right, thank you so much for watching, you guys. It was great doing this video. I can't wait to uh, show you part three where we wrap it up and finish these models off for the Protectorate of Menoth Cinerators. You can follow me at Facebook and Twitter at Warboss Tay. And um, if you want, you can also check out my website, Warboss Tay Studios. That's all one word, warbosstaystudios.com. And you can email me if you want to uh, talk about doing a commission for you, warbosstaystudios at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, you guys. I hope you're having a great day, a great weekend. And uh, happy Labor Day if uh, you celebrate that.